thank you all so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Are any of you all National Safety Council members in the audience? Okay, a few. Thank you all for raising your hands. Um, so at the National Safety Council, we've been around for over 100 years, and we focus on eliminating uh, preventable deaths and injuries. And when we look at the statistics about preventable deaths, uh, one occurs every four minutes. And generally, we're talking about the U.S. when I'm using statistics here this morning. And so that means we have over uh, 145,000 deaths that occur every year that are things that people would typically call an accident, motor vehicle crash, uh, overdose, a fall. But we know that the injury rates are much more significant beyond that. And again, when we talk about preventability, this is why you all exist, and it's really because there are a lot of things that we can control, things that we can improve and things that we can do better. So um, since we've been around for 100 years, there's a lot of things we've learned. The good news is we've done really well in certain spaces. And so what we want to try to do is transfer some of those lessons in the spaces where we have learned how to manage risk into spaces where we're not doing as well. And so the first thing that we want to do as an organization and with our member companies is to follow the data. And so when we look at injuries and fatalities, when the National Safety Council was found by business leaders over 100 years ago in the Chicago area, they said, we're killing and injuring too many people on the job. And so they got together, and like many of your captives, they shared best practices, they shared the results of investigations, they shared the findings that they had, and they began to educate themselves about how to make workplaces safer. But over the last 100 years, we really started to recognize that some of the risks that we had weren't just in workplaces, but they were when we were off work. They were on the roads, they were in our homes and communities, and indeed, we've seen those numbers go up. So I'm going to talk to you today about three issues that cross-cut workplaces, homes and communities, and on the road. And I think um, these three issues in particular for the healthcare sector are ones that you all uh, are impacted by and that you want to think about how to put some mitigation strategies into place. So I want to share with you, um, when we talk about numbers, um, numbers are something that at a high level the National Safety Council pays attention to, that you all pay attention to when you're looking at aggregate issues and trends. But at the end of the day, it's been said that statistics are just people with the tears wiped off. And at the end of the day, all of those numbers actually represent people. And the day that your number becomes a name is the day that this becomes important to you. Um, prior to coming to the National Safety Council, I worked for the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. We investigated plane crashes and train derailments. And this gentleman in the picture here was one of my colleagues at the NTSB. His name was Brian Fiffick. And he died at the age of he died at the age of 33 in a car crash. And even though that car crash did not occur while he was on the job, it affected all of us who worked there as if it had. We lost a colleague, we lost a friend, and it affected everybody. Not just his team, and that we had to backfill and replace and hire someone to, re to do his job, but that it affected us as an organization. We had a memorial service. Most every single person in the agency turned out, plus a lot of people who had left the agency and came back. But the day that your number becomes a name is the day that you say we can do better. And so when we talk about how some of these things are hard, how they're intractable issues, how they're difficult, it's not impossible to affect change in these spaces. And in many cases, it's because we haven't 
done the things that we need to do. And I know that you all know many of these things because you've seen change happen within your captives, within your organizations. So let's talk about workplace safety. We have done a great job in many spaces. It used to be very dangerous to go to work, but now we're nine times more likely to be injured or killed off the job than on the job. And so why, why is that? Part of it is because we put controls in place in workplaces. How many of you all decorated for Christmas before you came here, after Thanksgiving? For a show of hands, anybody use a ladder while they were decorating, hanging up lights outside? So yes, a number of hands were raised. Um, in my office, I wouldn't be allowed to get up on a ladder. We have a building maintenance guy, his name is Al, he changes the light bulbs, he hangs pictures, he does the things that require getting up on a ladder. We have safety procedures, play, you know, levels where people have to tie off. But at home, even though all of us probably have safety protocols and priorities in the workplace, we don't have those at home. And so when we look at this statistic about being nine times safer on the job than off the job, this is one of those reasons why. How many of the people in this room would consider themselves safety professionals? Okay, so you're accidental safety professionals, maybe, the rest of you, but that's okay. One of the things that we know is that we can kind of take that behavior um, and we can, we can learn. Um, a lot of, I, I know I didn't go to school, I didn't study safety in school. Um, I had the opportunity to learn it over the course of my career. So let's talk about um, some specific numbers with workplace fatalities. I bet this number here surprises most of you all. Almost 40% of workplace fatalities are attributed to motor vehicle crashes. Is anybody surprised by this? Yeah, are you guys just like not a hand-raising group? <laughs> I'm not sure if you're surprised or not surprised. Okay, so maybe because of the work that you do, you know that motor vehicle crashes are one of the leading causes of death when it comes to workplace fatalities. And there's an awful lot of injuries that go along with that. Certainly, there are certain sectors that have more risk, risk exposure because of the nature of their work. But when we talk about um, healthcare employees, and people who are in the healthcare sector, there's absolutely some space here where we want to think about this. And just like this story about Brian, it's not just about what happens on the job, it's about what happens off the job, too, that we need to think about, because there's a lot of trickle over, whether it's um, healthcare costs or uh, performance, absenteeism or presenteeism, that affects us when people when things happen off the job, then they end up bringing it into the workplace. So the first question that I would have for you all, as you look at your companies and you look at management, is simple things. What kind of controls do you have in place to help create a culture of safety when it comes to motor vehicle safety? How many of you have a cell phone policy for your employees? Okay, at least you guys are raising your hands, that's good. So for those of you all who raised your hands, how many of those policies apply to handheld, hands-free, when they're on duty, when they're using a company vehicle or a company phone? Or is it kind of a wraparound, all-inclusive? Okay, so fewer hands uh, raised on that one. So I'd say this is a very straightforward issue when you look at risk to address. You all can see it in this room. You can see it when you walk through the hallways. The level of distraction due to electronic devices, we just heard from our speaker, um, uh, the prior speaker, about the penetration of devices and technology. It's not gonna get better. It's gonna get worse. And so if you have kids um, or grandkids that use technology, I will tell you, I've got three boys and um, 12, 15, and 17, they do everything with those phones. You know what the biggest penalty, I've got a 15-year-old who's on restriction right now. The biggest penalty that we could impo impose on him, we took away his phone. That's their life. 
My 17-year-old, I walk into his room sometimes, he's brushing his teeth, holding his phone while he's brushing his teeth. We have got to think about the intersection of risk when people are behind the wheel and what that technology does. There's lots of ways to deal with this. We have a distracted driving toolkit for employers you can download on our website if you want to learn how to address the distracted driving issue. How many of you all have bought a new car in the last year? Raise your hands. And how many of you have been startled or surprised by something that your car did? So a number of those hands went back up. So there's a lot of technology that's in vehicles today that if it's a new car, then that technology is going to be new to you too. Another challenge is we have auto manufacturers who are putting technologies in cars that many times are different. If you have one car in your garage that's made by a certain manufacturer, you have a different car in your garage made by another manufacturer, the technologies in the car may not behave the same way. So if you have adaptive cruise control, so the old cruise control was set it at a specific speed limit, and it would keep that, hold that speed limit. Adaptive cruise control maintains distance between the cars in front of you. And so it'll speed up or slow down at your set speed, depending on what the other traffic's doing. It's smart cruise control. Well, depending on what kind of car you have, what's your following distance? If you have an icon that has a picture of one car, two cars, or three cars, does that translate into one second, two second, or three second following distance? Is it active at all speeds? Does it shut off when you go below a certain mile per hour? Does it have full stop capability if the traffic not just slows, but comes to a complete stop? How do you know this? And how do you want to find it out? Because I'll bet all the people who raise their hands about getting a new car, did not read their owner's manual. <laughs> and we tend to troubleshoot and read our owner's manual only when we have a problem. A light or an icon comes on and we go to try to figure out what happened. So the National Safety Council actually put together a public education campaign called My Car Does What? And it looks at 40 different vehicle technologies that are available now and explains in a short video, because again, we don't have a very long attention span, what the technology does, how it performs, but also what its limitations are, when it will not be active, um, when there might be problems or when it may not work. So this is a resource for you, again, for your employees. You wouldn't put a surgeon in an operating room with a new piece of equipment to do some complex surgery without explaining to them how it worked. Why do we think it's a good idea for all of us to go and engage in the most dangerous thing that we can do any day of the week, get in a car and drive on the road, and not explain to people how the technology works? We are going to continue to have conf confusion, and we'll continue to have challenges with technology when people don't know if they're in control or the car's in control. And we gotta, we've got to have those conversations as we see more and more automation in vehicles. So Carnegie Mellon did a study on vehicle technology, and they found that a million, 1.3 million crashes could be avoided, and 10,000 lives could be saved if just three technologies were adopted fleet-wide. And these are technologies that are available today in, in vehicles. Forward collision warning, lane departure warning, and blind spot monitor. How many of you all have cars with any of these technologies? Great. How many of you all have cars with all of these technologies? So what we need, because the average age of a car in the United States is 11 years, is we need more rapid adoption of this technology fleet-wide in order to see those life-saving gains. So technology can be a huge benefit to us as well, even short of fully automated vehicles. So when we look at the roadway fatalities, 
um, in the U.S., we actually have seen a 14% increase in the last two years. From 2014 to 15, there was an 8% increase, and 15 to 16, there was a 6% increase. Why? With all this new technology that should be helping us and saving lives, why are we seeing fatality numbers so high? There's certainly more exposure. So in those years, we did see an increase in vehicle miles traveled. So the economy is doing better, but that doesn't tell the whole story. We saw a 3% increase in VMT, in vehicle miles traveled, from 2014 to 2015, but we saw an 8% increase in fatalities. So it's not, um, it's not necessarily commensurate with the, with the VMT and the improvements in the economy. There's more things going on. So one of the things that we've done at the National Safety Council is last year with the Department of Transportation, we convened a, a group to establish a coalition to focus on getting to zero roadway deaths in the U.S. by 2050. What do we need to do? What's it going to take to get there? So longer term, uh, we've been working on a scenario development report that will get published next year to talk about what some of those gains are. The United States actually ranks 19th out of 20 industrialized countries when we look at improvements in roadway safety over the last two decades. We are not keeping pace with our industrialized counterparts when it comes to safety improvements and fatality improvements on the roadway. Does anybody want to hazard a guess of where some of the spaces where we don't do very well are? It's OK. Looking for audience participation. <laughs> Distracted driving, certainly that's an issue in, in uh, many other countries, and I know we have an international audience, there's zero tolerance for cell phone use behind the wheel. In the United States, we kind of have a zero tolerance for texting, even though 47 states have laws banning texting. How many people see people texting while they're driving? So that's, that's a law that people really aren't observing. Um, also, we don't have complete bans handheld or hands-free. And with vehicle manufacturers pushing vehicles where you pair your phone with your vehicle, they're really inviting people in to say, let's stay connected when you're behind the wheel. But at the end of the day, it's not your hand that's distracted. If it was your hand that was distracted holding the phone, we would have outlawed stick shift cars. It's your brain that's distracted. And when we talk about things that are hands-free, being safe, that's a myth. There was a lot of discussion about cognitive uh, processing and other things. Just think through what it takes to process um, while you're driving, that being driving on autopilot, when you're using your brain to process conversations. And when you think about it, I know many of, many of you all have people who are on the road a lot, asking your employees to do important business while they're behind the wheel is not good for business because they're not giving it their full attention, but it's also not good for you. You have the potential to really tell your employees that you don't value them as much as you value the revenue and the money that they're making. Their safety needs to be the most important thing to you all as risk managers. Um, what else? What, what do we not do as well here, or as well in the U.S. as, as other countries do uh, internationally? Impaired driving. Impaired driving. That's a great one. Um, for folks who come from uh, uh, other countries, certainly um, uh, U.K., uh, European Union, Sweden, um, we see internationally over 100 countries have BAC limits, legal impairment limits for alcohol that are 0 0.05, 0 0.03, 0 0.02, and even zero. Does anybody know what the U.S.'s legal limit is? 0 0.08. And there was one state that actually passed a law this year to bring their uh, legal limit down to 0 0.05. Does anybody know who that was? They were actually the ones that passed the first 0 0.08. Uh, limit as well. Utah. So if you think about it a little bit, um, that you know that you might have a more receptive audience uh, politically in Utah for that. 
But at the end of the day, the rest of the country moved down to 0.08, but it took almost 20 years for us to get there. We trail other countries internationally when it comes to impairment limits for alcohol. Um, there's a lot of other um, things like enforcement and what tolerance we have for enforcement, um, whether or not we can do roadside sobriety uh, checks. Uh, many of you all who have lived around the world in other countries, you know you can do rolling, uh, rolling breath tests uh, in many other countries. If you know there's a checkpoint and you could be, and you could be subjected to that, it really makes sense not to leave the pub and drive your car. Um, so when it comes to speed, We've got big issues with speed. We don't, uh, uh, automated enforcement has fallen out of favor in the United States because one of the concerns for many people is that it's a revenue raiser. Well, it's absolutely a revenue raiser, but guess what? It's really effective at slowing people down, keeping them from running red lights. And I think we're losing that uh, argument in the public debate. So there's a lot of things that we can do. We've discussed some things on the behavioral side. We've discussed some things on the motor vehicle technology side, but we have some opportunities to make big gains. Last year, we lost over 40,000 lives to motor vehicle crashes. Every single one of those is completely preventable. So let me, ta let me come back to something that uh, a lot of people may be not aware of. Um, you all may be aware of because you, of the business that you work in, but 30% of fatalities on the roadway actually arrive at the hospital alive. But they die within that 30-day window. And so one of the things that we want to think through is if we really want to make a difference and get down to zero, it can't be um, just in one space. It's going to take a multi-pronged approach. How many of you all are familiar or feel like you could operate an AED, CPR, AED machine? They have them in a lot of public places. Um, they have them, uh, many of you may have them in your facilities or your buildings, you may have them in airports. They talk you through it. They help you to administer this. How many of you all, as one of the conditions for your uh, organizations, will have everyone be first aid and CPR qualified? I mean, that's probably the green fees for being in healthcare, right? Um, but when we look at what people know, and what we've shared with people and how we've trained them, whether, it comes, whether it's first aid or CPR or something else, one of the things that people are most likely to take advantage of when we talk about those people who die in the post-crash environment is controlling bleeding. And you're much more likely to use a tourniquet than CPR at the scene of a car crash. Why don't we have tourniquets in every spare tire kit or in every glove box? The military has learned a tremendous amount in the last 20 to 30 years when it comes to field medicine and being able to survive uh, explosions of IED or different attacks. We have watched over the last few years, whether it's Las Vegas, and an active shooter, or whether it's Boston Marathon and a bombing, that very often bystanders are first responders. But if they don't understand how to control the bleed, you don't have the seconds or the minutes that it's going to take for the first responders who are medically trained to arrive on scene. Why isn't this something that we talk about? Why isn't it something that we train and share with our kids in school? So this is one of the examples of how we think about things in a multi-pronged approach. If we really want to get to zero, what do we need to be doing? So solving motor vehicle fatalities, three ways that I want you all to think about that you can do that is by, uh, by using best practices. So we have a safe driver toolkit. You can download that. We have a cell phone policy kit specifically, if you're interested in that. You can think about your vehicles. If you are responsible for any fleets, they should have this technology. Commercial vehicles, passenger vehicles, there's a lot of technology out there that can help reduce claims and prevent injuries and fatalities. Joining a coalition like the Road to Zero, 
free to join. We have over 450 members that have joined the coalition, not just transportation entities, but other organizations who say it's going to take a societal change and a cultural change for the Novocaine to wear off that 40,000 deaths on our roadways is acceptable. So talking about opioids, this is an issue that has gotten a lot of attention, certainly in the US. Um, recently, the president had a commission. They made over 50 recommendations on this issue. And it's also been declared a national emergency, a national health epidemic. So the National Safety Council has actually been working on this issue for over five years, because again, we follow the data. We were watching since 1990s. The number of poisonings has gone up drastically, and now the, num the total number of poisonings actually eclipses motor vehicle crashes as the leading cause of death in the United States. The majority of poisonings are overdoses, drug overdoses, and the majority of those drug overdoses are from prescription painkillers. And so uh, 22,000 from prescription painkillers and another 10,000 from heroin. 80% of new heroin users start with prescription painkillers. So it's really important for us to think through this, and I'd say particularly in the healthcare sector, this is an issue that you want to pay attention to because there's a much higher prevalence and the access that people have in that environment uh, is another risk that you want to think through. So certainly the number of prescriptions has jumped. We've also seen a quantum uh, leap with respect to fatalities uh, due to unintentional overdoses. It's actually the leading cause of preventable injury death for um, uh, people really starting age 25 uh, through to senior citizens in the US. And so it's really affecting all age groups. So this is my son, Taylor. He is um, 17 years old. He's a senior in high school. And he had a rite of passage um, in August before school started. This is Taylor on drugs. <laughs> he had his wisdom teeth removed. So many of you all uh, may have had to escort your children um, to get their wisdom teeth removed. And <laughs> so, yes, I know, I, I have to always tell people, Taylor knows that I'm using his picture, and the negotiation there was his younger brother had taken some videos of him, and I'm not using those. <laughs> so, um, so Taylor, when he went to go... Uh, get his wisdom teeth taken out. His dad and I took him to the um, oral surgeon's office, and while he was in surgery, the assistant gave us four prescriptions to go get filled while we were waiting for him to come out. And one was an antibiotic, one was a, a rinse, um, but one of them was for something called Conzip. And um, I looked it up, because this is what I do, and Conzip is a brand name for Tramadol. I asked the assistant uh, who had given me the prescriptions, are any of these opioids? And she looked me in the eye and she said, no. And of course I turned to my husband and I was very annoyed because I knew it was, one of them was an opioid. And I said, let's go get this filled at the pharmacy. <laughs> Took the uh, prescriptions to the pharmacy, came back to pick them up. The assistant, uh, the clerk at the pharmacy, um, brought me the prescriptions. Mind you, she got three of them from one location, and she had to go to another spot in the pharmacy to get the fourth one, because it's a controlled substance. So it's in a different place. And I asked her, are any of these opioids? And she said, no, I don't think so. Let me, let me check. And she asked the pharmacist who was walking by, and he said, yes, this is a synthetic opioid. And I share this story with you because I know about this issue and I understand this issue, but yet the people who were giving me prescriptions did not even know what they were giving me. And if I hadn't done my own research and had just listened to what they said, I wouldn't have been that concerned. So the National Safety Council in 2014 actually published uh, some research and one of the things 
um, that I was able to look up while I was in the doctor's office. I know it's probably hard to see. This is a bit of an eye chart. But the red bar, this is the number needed to treat uh, for the efficacy of pain treatment. The red bar is the one that's the most effective for most people, and it's a combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen. That's over-the-counter Tylenol and Advil. Much cheaper than a prescription painkiller and much more effective. But prescription painkillers have been marketed as the Cadillac of pain treatment for 20 years. When we did a survey of Americans, we asked them, have you taken an opioid in the last two years? We re released the results of the survey earlier this year. We had about 28% who responded yes, they had taken an opioid. Later in the survey, we asked people, have you taken Vicodin, Oxycontin? Um, we listed brand names, common brand names of the painkillers, and guess what? That number shot up by almost 15% when we gave them the brand names. People do not understand that the formulation that they're taking is an opioid. And when we talk about opioids, we're talking about opium and heroin, and these are synthetic formulations of the drugs, but they are highly addictive. And patients are not receiving information from their doctors about this. And in many ways, it's on us as patients to understand what we're taking. The National Safety Council published information about the, um, about the best practices. And this is um, from the Journal of the American Dental Association. And it recommends best practice for wisdom teeth extraction is a combination of acetaminophen and ibuprofen. So you better believe that I sent a letter to uh, the doctor who had performed the surgery on my son and shared with him this information um, and asked if I could come and have a conversation with him. That, that, that was a little uh, more complex. I mean, I was listening to the 54321 this morning. That was one of those things where I was like, oh, do I do this? I mean, he's, he's the professional. He's the expert. But the reality is, this was my son. And people were giving me something where they didn't know what they were giving him. And he got a six-day supply. And this, the CDC recommendations for opioids, for prescription, prescription painkillers, is no more than a three-day supply. And that's for chronic pain. This was acute pain. My son didn't need any of them. He didn't take any of them. I asked him after he came out of the, um, the surgery and the um, after effects, you know, did he feel uncomfortable? Did his mouth hurt? And he said a little bit, and we gave him the ibuprofen and the Tylenol. And he never asked for anything more. I mean, he took some more ibuprofen and Tylenol, but he never said it really hurts bad, you know, something doesn't feel good. He was okay. But I know an awful lot of families who have had kids who have gotten hooked on prescription painkillers, and things did not, uh, did not go well for them. Very, very sad, very sad stories. In the U.S., we uh, released results. One out of four people in the U.S. knows someone who's become addicted, knows someone who's overdosed on prescription painkillers, or has themselves been, become addicted. This is a very, very common issue. But there's a lot of stigma attached to addiction, and so we don't talk about it. So when it comes to employers, when we talk about the workforce, we took a survey uh, and released the results earlier this year. It was a nationwide survey, um, large and small employers, many of them multinationals. 70% of them have been impacted by um, prescription drugs in their workplace. And that was everything from people being arrested or overdosing to absenteeism and presenteeism. 75% of the people who are addicted are in the workforce. So if you don't think that this is an issue that you need to deal with, think again. We have a lot of programs where we look at uh, drugs and alcohol, but the most likely thing people are going to be impaired by 
are going to be prescription drugs. How many of you all have a drug panel or a test that you all do for your employees that includes opioids? This is, so to those of you who do have that, that's great. For those of you who don't, this is a huge opportunity. And it's an opportunity because it's important for you to know what's going on with that workforce, but it's also an opportunity to address risks. When I first came to the council, we were about to put out our employer toolkit, and I had just been there for about two months, and I said, do we do everything that we're asking other employers to do in the toolkit? And they said, well, we don't do the um, drug testing for the opioids. And I said, well, I just was hired. I had my pre-employment. I had to go give my sample before I um, was brought on. And I said, so I know we do this. I said, can we find out how much it'll cost us? And um, our HR team came back and said it didn't cost us anything to go from the sixth panel that we were doing to a 12th panel. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case for all of you, but you should at least explore it. People are much more likely to be impaired at work by prescription drugs than by illicit drugs. And if you don't address those, you're only hitting a portion of the, of the issue. You're still going to have the mistakes, you're still going to have the risks, and you're going to still have the liability. We, um, we work with a number of organizations, and when we talk about addiction, and we talk about drug use and substance misuse, this is not people in the city on the street corner shooting up. This is people who look just like you and me. It's people who work in your hospitals, they work in your nursing homes. We have an issue with this that we can address, we can do something about it. And we know that when people have programs in their workplaces where they can get help, it's actually much more successful than if they get um, an intervention through their family or friends. Why is that? Anybody want to hazard a guess? So their livelihoods, right? Financial well-being, that's their paycheck and their job is going to depend on them staying clean. What else? Right, so you can actually have as a condition of continued employment that they have to stay clean and they have to submit to regular uh, drug testing or random. So there may be conditions that get built in. Their health care, their family's health care, their dependents, everyone is potentially relying on that. There's a lot more controls and there's a lot more people that pot potentially can be trained to recognize uh, substance misuse too. I'd like to share um, a short video with you. We just launched a public education campaign called Stop Everyday Killers and it's focused on opioids. We're going to go to video now. Some of the things I put my family through, it's hard not to get emotional over it. Um, because there's a period of time that uh, I would be mad. I would be mad at the world that I actually woke up in the morning. My life was, uh, was really good. You know, mom, dad, picket fence, brother, sister, uh, family pet, uh, private schools, and uh, I have really, really favorable, enjoyable memories of growing up. When I, when I had the injury, um, that, was, that was actually the first time that I was ever prescribed a pain medication. I'd been a nurse since 1996. Uh, I graduated with, uh, my, with my bachelor's degree in nursing, and at the time of my injury, I had been actually practicing anesthesia as a nurse for three or four years. Uh, those in the healthcare industry who are, who are entrusted with uh, the keys to the pharmacy and the keys to the, to the well-being of, of, of patients, I mean, how could they possibly get addicted to uh, prescription medication? Uh, and then it happened to me. And once it happened to me, I realized there's another side to the story. My patients received what they needed for surgery, and I often discarded half of that medication. And I found myself one time uh, taking the waste medication, squirted it under my tongue. I was able to perform high-risk anesthesia on very sick patients while in the throes of an addiction. Addiction doesn't look like you're incapacitated and you can't do anything. Addiction doesn't look like uh, you're a degenerate and you're living homeless on the streets. Uh, addiction is often very functional. Addiction hides in your family. It hides at your profession. 
I remember the last thing that uh, Claudia told me as I walked off into a treatment center where I would spend the next nearly three months. And, um, but she said, um, I'm gonna love you until you can love yourself. The first step of my journey towards recovery was that moment and those last words that she said to me. So Rigo is one of our survivor advocates. Um, he was injured, um, had a sports injury, and uh, he started taking prescription painkillers. You could hear him talk about that journey. Um, Claudia is his wife. They have four beautiful kids together. And Claudia um, was a charge nurse at the hospital where Rigo was an anesthesiologist. And they didn't know uh, how to get help without jeopardizing their livelihood, their career, their future. So what programs do you have in place to make sure that you don't have people like Rigo working in your facilities? There's a lot of things that you all talk about, about how to reduce risk, how to address med medical malpractice, how to address medical errors, but you have to start at the root cause. Human beings make mistakes. Understand why those happen. Do those mistakes happen because they're impaired? Do those mistakes happen because they're fatigued? Do those mistakes happen because they're not familiar with the equipment or are not trained? Just saying we can't make mistakes doesn't solve the problem. So when we talk about um, the cost, um, we know that employees who are in treatment save companies money. Not addressing this issue, putting your head in the sand, costs you money. So we have a substance uh, a, uh, use calculator, and um, you can visit our website, put in information about the company, the number of employees, the location, and you can find out how much that cost is if you don't address it. Um, so not addressing it isn't a great solution. In addition to, to financial costs, think about the, the losses that you experience with absenteeism and presenteeism. We know that employees who are in treatment are better employees. They perform better, they, they show up. Um, so thinking about how you address this issue, I know it's not easy, but we do have a toolkit uh, for employers to look at how to address this issue, about putting policies together, about drug testing programs, about education uh, response. You all have probably IEP programs. What are best practices there? Um, how do you engage HR in this space? So I met, uh, shared with you the video of Rigo. Um, he is one of our survivor advocates, and actually now he runs two treatment centers uh, that are focused on helping professionals who are in addiction. And obviously that started out trying to help medical uh, professionals. The uh, campaign uh, is called Stop Everyday Killers. It launched in Chicago this month, or in December. We're gonna launch a social media uh, video and campaign, and we're also taking the memorial on the road. And so we're gonna be in Pittsburgh, Washington, D.C., Atlanta. Um, if this is something that you all are interested in, um, maybe sponsoring or participating in, uh, please don't hesitate to come see me. Um, we can certainly look at adding other cities to uh, the road show. So solving the opioid crisis there, yes, it's a challenge, but again, want to come to you not just with problems, but also solutions. There's things that you can do, a lot of information available on our website. So we do have drug and alcohol programs, but one of the things that's really hard to detect is fatigue. And so when we look at the intersection of motor vehicle crashes and workplace fatalities, one of the things, and I'd say this is a real issue for you all in the healthcare industry, is fatigue. Um, if you are thinking about people working a long shift, one of the most dangerous parts of their day is their drive home after that. Um, really, there's, there's a lot of research out there um, that talks about that, 
But I think one of the things that we don't equate fatigue with is absolute impairment. And so this, this chart really shows if you're an eight-hour sleeper and you get six hours, it's like having a 0.05 BAC. If you're a seven-hour sleeper normally and you get five hours, it's like having a 0.05 BAC. So just getting less than you normally get affects you. We all know that. We feel crummy. Our eyes are gritty. We're more snappy at people, but we know it impairs our decision-making and our ability to be effective. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand up, because I know you need a little ergo break. So go ahead, stretch. Uh, make sure you get your back stretched out. You've been sitting for a long time this morning. And um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. This is about how much sleep you get and how difficult uh, it is to get a good night's sleep. So, if you have ever pulled an all-nighter for your job, or if you've driven overnight to get to a destination, like Disney World or something, please take a seat. If you fall asleep on the couch while you're watching TV, please take a seat. <laughs> And I noticed that, that we have more women standing than men, and that's usually because of football and Thanksgiving and the couch and TV. So um, if you have ever sacrificed sleep for a work deadline, staying up too late or having to wake up too early, please take a seat. Seriously? <laughs> So congratulations to the three of you who are still standing. You guys must be very good about going to sleep at the same time every night. Yes? Yes? Regular, bed, regular bedtime? Yeah, so my husband is one of those people who has, who has like a biological clock, and it's, when it's time to go to sleep, it's time to go to sleep. And uh, I am not one of those people. I'm definitely a night owl. But I know that that impairment that we get from not sleeping enough really does affect our performance. So when you all look at this picture, does it make you nervous or feel uncomfortable or give you anxiety? <laughs> so I know a lot of you probably spend a lot of time on the road and in hotels, and you know if you forget your charging cord, for your phone, that's like worse than forgetting your toothpaste or anything else, right? You can, you can easily find out, you know, get the front desk to help you out, but char not being able to charge your phone is one of the really, really kind of problem things when you're on the road because there's so much there. That's our life, right? Our schedules, our way to communicate with people, emails. So if, you, if this makes you nervous, seeing this low battery, how many of you all would, left, would leave your room in the morning with their battery looking like this. Anybody? anybody? Not if you can help it. <laughs> but how many of you all got at least seven hours of sleep last night? So a couple of you, actually, you guys are doing really good. Good job over here. <laughs> Jackie, I didn't see you raise your hand. Oh, you did? OK, good, good. That's what I was going to say, when you're running a conference, it's really hard to be the person who gets a good night's sleep, so good for you. So why are we OK with making sure our, our phone battery's charged and we prioritize that, but we don't prioritize charging our battery? So when you leave your room and you haven't had a good night's sleep, your performance is impaired. And so when we think about people who are doing very safety sensitive work, like particularly the healthcare industry, and we think about the kind of hours that they work and their opportunity for sleep and rest, this is a really significant issue. Are people fit for duty when they report to work? And are they fit to drive home at the end of a long shift or a shift and a half or a double? So when we look at safety consequences from fatigue, and I worked at the National Transportation Safety Board for 10 years, 
and I looked at hundreds of investigations during that period of time. And I'll tell you the two most common contributing factors were distraction and fatigue. And the reason why we were able to get to fatigue is because we had a process and we had a protocol to do that. We had a checklist after every investigation, um, after every event occurred. We had human factors specialists. We looked at their 72-hour, at a minimum, work-rest history. Um, we were able to look at a lot of things. Most of the time, in investigations and workplaces, people don't have that ability to do those detailed investigations, so we often miss fatigue. What time of day did the event occur? How many hours had they been awake? What was the time on task, the continuous time on task? But we know that there are catastrophic outcomes when people are fatigued. These are just three high visibility events where fatigue was a factor. So what do we need to do? Um, the National Safety Council has been working um, with Dr. Charles Seisler and his team. Um, Dr. Seisler is at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and, Brigham and Women's Hospital. We've trained our employees. They all were trained uh, in sleep health, and we screened them for sleeping disorders. 10% of the population has sleep apnea. If you don't think sleep disorders affect your workforce, Think again, 30% have difficulty getting a good night's sleep. Sleep apnea, insomnia, restless leg syndrome, medications they might be taking that might make it difficult for them to fall asleep or stay asleep. So helping people to understand about electronic devices, about alcohol consumption, about all of those things that might affect their ability to get a good night's sleep is important. Sleep disorder screening, 90% of sleep disorders go undiagnosed. 20% of motor vehicle fatalities are attributed to drowsy driving. And we think that's vastly underreported. So when we talk about solving fatigue, we have a cost calculator. Um, again, you can visit our website. These are free uh, tools. And you can put in the type of work that, you, that your employees are doing. And I think particularly in the healthcare sector, there's a lot of shift work. And so there's, there's a lot of impact when people do shift work. Um, how many of the people in this room have done shift work in their careers? It's miserable, isn't it, right? Very painful because we're diurnal creatures. It doesn't matter how long you're on night shift, your body does not adjust. Biologically, we are programmed to be awake during the day and sleep at night. You can develop coping strategies, you can develop uh, tools, you can create rooms that have window darkening shades, um, you can have schedule, but the science shows us that people who work the night shift don't get as good sleep. It's often con not, bro not consolidated, they're breaking it up into multiple sleep opportunities, um, and they don't get as good quality sleep. The duration is not as long, even when you add up their multiple opportunities. So really, really a challenging uh, situation, but there are ways to solve it. So I've talked to you about three things. Um, there's a lot more, of course, that we could talk about. I'm certainly open to any conversations that you all want to have after the session. But if you think about motor vehicle fatalities, and you think about opioids, and you think about fatigue, these are three ways that you all as organizations can address the issues of the numbers. But I want to go back to the people and, um, uh, you know, talk, we can talk about numbers, but at the end of the day, we all want to focus on the people that are important. And for each of you in this room, I would say, um, I know this is like age progression here. <laughs> um, this is like three years in between these two pictures. Um, my, two of my sons are now taller than me, and that's just what happens when they're teenagers. But when we talk about the people who are close to us, one of the things that I found when I was at the NTSB, um, one of my jobs as a board member on scene, was to go to accident sites. And whenever there was a plane crash or a train derailment or a pipeline explosion, and there were fatalities, there were invariably many more people that would show up to the accident site to collect personal effects, take the remains home, learn what happened, and try to understand. So for every one person that was killed, there were probably five people that would show up. And I would say for each of you in this room, 
if you got a text, uh, even during my speech, that something had happened to one of the five people that you really care about, you would drop everything and you'd walk out and you'd go to be by their bedside or you'd go to be there um, to bring them home. And there's probably five people in your life who would do the same thing for you. And I know you have a lot of balls that you're juggling. I know you're responsible for a lot of things at work. You have committees that you volunteer for. You may participate in things in your community like your church or your kids' teams. And there's never enough hours in the day to do what you feel like you need to do. So as you're juggling all those balls in the air, I would say, look at those balls. They're not all equal. Some of the balls are made of rubber and they will bounce. You can get a new car, you can get a new job, you can get a new home. But some of those balls are made of glass. And if you drop them and they break, you can't put them back together again. And so those five people in your life, those are your glass balls. So you have to keep an eye on them. Because invariably at accident scenes, when people died out of order and unexpectedly, the only thing that family members really wanted was just a little bit more time. They wanted to be able to say the things they hadn't said. They wanted to give that person a hug. And they wanted to let them know that they were loved. And so kind of closing out on the message that you heard first thing this morning with five, four, three, two, one, go, I would say think of your glass balls. And if you've been putting off that visit with your mom or your dad or you haven't told that kid that you missed his National Honor Society swearing in because you were on a trip and you haven't sat down and told him how proud of him you are, Take what Mel said this morning. Those are your glass balls. Don't put it off. Take time today to make a phone call or get on FaceTime or write somebody a letter. Because at the end of the day, those are the people. Those are not statistics. Those are the people that matter. And every single one of us wants to get back home to our family safety, safely, and we want them to come back to us. And so when we talk about the things that we do and why, the we, why we do them, yes, it's about risk reduction. Yes, it's about cost savings. But at the end of the day, it's about people. So we want to take care of those things and really focus people on why they're doing what they do. So um, thank you all so much. And if there's time for any questions, I'm happy to take them. But as we discussed last night, I'm the only thing in between you and the lunch buffet. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, if you could just take a, just a minute to let folks know how they can join National Safety Council, I think that would be useful. Sure. Um, so there is one person that I do want to recognize uh, here, and I'm going to ask him to come up. Um, Andy, if you could come up. Uh, just wanted to say thank you to you. Um, the National Safety Council is a not-for-profit, and we um, have, again, 13,500 member organizations. Um, Andy Johnson is our vice chair uh, of the National Safety Council, but we also have the benefit of having many uh, of captive resources captives that have chosen to join the National Safety Council. And so you can certainly join the National Safety Council as an association, as an individual company, but I would say one of the best surrogates for talking about how this works for captives is probably Andy, um, if you wanna uh, get some experience on how that's worked for them. And I'd say we probably have almost unanimous uh, support when a captive joins for them to come on. So uh, a lot of people have re-upped uh, with us as, as you go through that process. And so we're really all about supporting the companies to be safer. But I wanted to present Andy for his volunteer service with the council for many years with a challenge coin. Is anybody in the room familiar with challenge coins? This is like not a hand raising group, is it? <laughs> so um, come on, I see some short haircuts there. No, no military service in the room. 
So challenge coins, um, actually our tradition in the military um, started uh, uh, back in the World War I where a soldier was across enemy lines, but these are given um, from a leader of an organization to someone who's done uh, something uh, that merits attention or is really distinguishes them. And I would say, Andy, without captive resources um, in the National Safety Council under your leadership, we would not nearly be uh, as successful as an organization as we are. So thank you. And that's thank how you. you. Do it, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that so much.